will gavel in the uh, Thursday meeting, June 21st of the Bicycle Pedestrian Advisory Committee. And if you can join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. So now we have open time for the public to make any comments for any items that are not listed on the agenda. Cindy, can you turn on your uh, microphone, please? Okay. Can you, can you hear me? I think so. You can. Uh, Thank you. <laughs> I have a couple of purely Larkspur items, but I'm going to mention them because a lot of Corte like to cycle back and forth between. Um, I think it was last week I wrote David McPherson a email and I said that the path around Redwood High School would get started this year. That is not going to happen because the contractor's prices have gone up so much and we only have so much money in the city for bike ped projects. So the money will be spent, the money we do have will be spent on Magnolia improvements better crosswalks mainly, but that's good for cyclists too. And the other money that's devoted to Redwood High School, I think will be kept in a separate pot and it will still be there, but we need to have some more money to add to it. There's a critical little curb cutout that isn't there at the entrance to the East Redwood High School parking lot. It's very dangerous. That will be fixed next year under Measure B, that money is safe, so I think it will actually be done. And then I spoke with Bill Whitney at TAM on June 11th, and the path, the narrow path along the northbound off-ramp over the creek will be somewhat delayed because Caltrans told TAM that they didn't much like the way the new path would be joined to the bent caps. And for people here who may not know, those are the horizontal concrete beams that stick out from either side. So Caltrans said, we will do it. And that's all very well and good, but they work at a glacial pace. So Bill thinks they'll be finished about the end of the year, and that means moving the beginning of that project into next year. But it will be done. And Bill has not forgotten about the southern part of the North-South Greenway. So that's all I can think of to say. Thank you. Thank you, Cindy. Any other members of the public? Hi. Jean Severinghouse, uh, Greenbrae Boardwalk. And um, hello to Bob. Um, hope you're recovering well. Um, just two quick things. One is um, perhaps Director um, Brown may have an update, but the we're meeting tomorrow with the Caltrans Bicycle and Pedestrian Advisory um, Committees joined for the Bay Area, and we're looking at a whole new PID, it's called Project Initiation Document, which is how things get started. And it looks like the Tamalpais Drive overcrossing priority has been moved to bridge preservation, and I don't see anything about ADA improvements. So if possible, it'd be great if I think Director Brown may have been to a more recent meeting and might have some information. And then the second thing is that um, Caltrans gave a grant to Corte Madera for adaptation planning that I believe the Corte Madera Council said they'd move forward on um, on the June 19th meeting. And I would love to know, it, it, it's the statement quoted that it's um, going to affect transportation corridors between Trump's Drive and Sir Francis Drake Boulevard. And those of us who live in that neighborhood would really like to know what, we'd like to be part of that um, discussion. And also since the North-South Greenway goes through there, it seems like this BPAC might like to be part of that discussion. Thank you. Thank you. Seeing no other members <laughs> of the public uh, with comments, uh, we'll turn it 
over to uh, Director Peter Brown to introduce our new senior engineers. Thank you, Vice Chair McPherson. Uh, briefly, I'll respond to a couple of the comments uh, from the public. Uh, regarding the Tamalpais Drive US 101 overcrossing project, uh, I have been meeting with Caltrans. We've had a couple of meetings over the last few months, and that project continues. It's in what we call the pre-PID phase, the pre-project initiation document phase. And uh, there will be, uh, we are addressing ADA, uh, Americans with Disability Act improvements in that project. And Caltrans has been very receptive to town input in terms of uh, beginning to look at different alternatives. Uh, the next meeting for that group, uh, the working group for that, uh, will be uh, likely in September, October this fall. And so uh, I'll know more after that meeting, and I'll certainly keep uh, BPAC in the loop. And then regarding the Caltrans uh, Transition Planning Adaptation Grant, that we did receive $325,000, uh, a, a very a very good sum for Corte Madera to begin to look at uh, how we address climate change. And, and there'll be a focus on the transportation infrastructure, but we'll also be looking at all components of climate adaptation. And it's required in that grant that we have at least three public meetings and a pretty, I would call it a robust public process. So we'll, we'll get out in the community. Uh, we'll invite folks in English and Spanish. Uh, to participate, uh, and so if I were a member of the public, I, would, I wouldn't worry too much about it. We'll have a lot of public meetings. Uh, we may even dedicate an entire BPAC meeting uh, to the multimodal uh, components uh, that that grant may address. Um, and then more to your point about introductions, I'm, I'm happy to introduce uh, two new senior engineers. Uh, I'll start uh, in the order that they began. Uh, Jared Berrio uh, is a Cal Poly San Luis Obispo uh, engineering uh, student graduate from about uh, 10, 11 years ago, and he spent uh, the bulk of his career, the last decade, uh, focusing on uh, building structural engineer uh, in Santa Rosa for ZFA uh, engineering, and he's got a, a, both a, a California license as a civil engineer and as a structural engineer, and so he brings both those levels of expertise to the town. And uh, I also happen to know that he used to spend some time uh, riding his bike with a team called Jittery Joes. I don't know if you guys remember the Jittery Joes bicycling team, but so Jared has a lot of uh, pedestrian and bicycle experience, and, and he certainly has uh, qualifications that, that the town benefits from in terms of a civil engineer. Um, RJ Suko uh, is a, a graduate of UC Davis, um, also studied civil engineering there, and the bulk of his career has been at the County of Marin. So he spent the last 10 years there, and he is very familiar with everything that we do in terms of funding, uh, you know, sidewalks, bike lanes, intersection improvements, uh, you know, the whole gamut. He needs very little training, so he's hit the ground running. The only thing we need to train him on is that we report to a town council, not a board of supervisors. And aside from that, um, he's uh, fully capable and already picking up a, a heavy workload. And you'll hear from both of them tonight on the projects that they're working on. Um, so if you're ready, Chair McPherson, we can go on to the discussion items. Um, my understanding is that Jared will be the interface with Public Works uh, and will be at each of the BPAC meetings and you will only appear now whenever it's necessary. Is that fair? For the next few meetings, it'll be both Jared and I and then RJ if he has projects uh, that are, you know, require input from BPAC. Uh, but uh, yeah, the long-term vision is that, uh, that Jared will be the liaison to BPAC. So you'll see a lot of him. Yeah. Well, welcome, you guys. Yeah. Couldn't be more happy. Yeah, let's go ahead and move on to the next I item. And this is the San Rafael sidewalk rehab program and, and uh, how it uh, might instruct Corte Madera and some of the questions that we have had. Correct. By way of introduction, we've had multiple requests from members of the community, uh, I think people from council, as well as um, uh, maybe even BPAC members have, you know, asked the town, you know, what are we doing in terms of improving our sidewalk infrastructure? And, you know, San Rafael is a neighbor of ours, you know, the town to the north, that, and they have a robust sidewalk rehabilitation program. And so what RJ is going to do is kind of go over their program, talk to, talk to you all about it, seek your input. And I think over the next couple of years, uh, the town is certainly interested in 
developing a similar program, and we'll you know kind of have to pick which components of the program we like and we'd like to implement uh, versus uh, what we won't. And just one thing that I'll you'll hear from RJ, but I'll repeat now, is that you know the sidewalk is in front of the property owner. Is there, it is a public right of way? It's one of those weird things. It's a public right of way, but at the same time, it's the responsibility of the property owner to to maintain it in a safe and operable condition. Uh, and so what Santa Fe has done uh, is, you know, kind of struck a balance between <coughs> the public and, and private responsibility. And, and Corte Madera, as far as I know, is interested in doing the same. Um, so RJ, um, it's all you. All right. Thank you. Good evening. Thanks for having me. So yeah, as Peter mentioned, I'm just going to provide a brief overview about Santa Fe's program. Um, obviously, we want to get your input on pieces you like, maybe pieces that you don't like and, and see kind of where that takes us. So just kind of at a very basic level, you know, these are kind of the common types of deficiencies. Um, tripping hazards, I would say, is probably, you know, the most um, high priority given, you know, the higher number of slip and falls. Um, but you do have others such as just damage, um, uplift from trees, which also causes tripping hazards, and then sloped uh, sidewalks, which can be an ADA um, barrier or, um, or issue there. So I apologize, it's a little tight on the screen. Um, we did, I don't know if everyone got a chance to grab one of these, but um, they'll pass them around. Send those down. Um, basically, that's the fine print on the town's municipal code in um, relating to this responsibility of sidewalk that Peter mentioned. And, and basically, in a nutshell, it's, it's saying the owner of a parcel um, is responsible for repair and maintenance of the sidewalk area and shall pay the cost and expense of the repair and maintenance thereof. And then to a second point also um, is basically uh, sidewalk needs to be in safe condition and is more or less liable. And um, we also reference a second code. This is out of California Streets and Highways. So this is um, kind of a, a statewide um, code that's available and it, it basically mirrors that same um, concept. Um, so going into Sandra Fell's program into specifics, a um, couple things to point out, and again, it's, it's a little tight for, um, sorry if you can't read it all. Um, some things to note, so they have a annual application period and from there, they then do two lotteries, one for lower income folks and one for um, those that don't fall in that category. And based on their um, funding and number of people they feel are gonna apply, they're picking about 150 people. And those could fall into um, some form of sidewalk repair. Some could just be grinding the sidewalk and um, removing minor tripping hazards. Others could be complete removal of concrete and putting it back. And some could be that plus trees because, you know, when you have a uh, sidewalk being up uplifted by roots, um, that problem is usually going to continue unless you, you know, put a root barrier or remove the tree. So they evaluate all those once they've um, gone through the lottery process. Um, something to note is because their um, streets and highways and their ordinances uh, typically say that curb and gutter is the responsibility of the city, they've taken the position that they will pay for the majority of that or 100% up to a certain limit. So they kind of break those costs out. Um, so after everyone's um, selected, they'll go through a pre-inspection process. Um, they'll meet with the residents. They'll talk about what's up for the local match or the, um, the city share and what would be funded by them. Um, and there's some stipulations on, on things they wouldn't fund. So this just goes into specifics about um, how the context would be held between um, the contractor versus the city and the property owner and then how payments would be made. Basically, they've just delineated those to keep things clean. Um, as part of the process, uh, the fronting property owners would also have to enter into an encroachment permit, but if it's for 
um, areas that the city agrees is an improvement, they will waive any fees on that. Um, but that also triggers inspections pre and post. So that's kind of just a rundown, you know, it's, it's you know, a five or six step process, um, but overall there's, there's, you know, definitely some benefits. So this slide, it gets into specifics on the funding levels. Um, so sidewalk repair and replacement, they're willing to share half, up to $1,000. Um, this, where it says the next line down, driveway approach and replacement. So this is one that they don't fund. Um, so if someone's just trying to get a free driveway, then odds are they're not gonna get that. Um, curb and gutter, they've taken responsibility 100% um, up to $4,000. And then they have a separate cost breakdown for tree work. So if you go to the bottom half of the slide, those are all itemized and um, they vary quite a bit. Um, same thing if you live on a corner and you have a ADA curb ramp, they would fund that as the city's responsibility. And then just for an idea, bottom left are just some contractor costs. Um, $18 a square foot for sidewalk. So, you know, each square is about 16 square feet. So that's kind of the basic rundown on, on the program. Uh, we wanted to leave a lot of question for, or a lot of time for question and answer. So anything you have, happy to do what I can to fill you in. Okay, so we'll go ahead and have uh, members ask any questions. The public can provide us with any comment and then we'll see if there's any discussion to be had. The couple of things that I wanted to know is whether or not San Rafael has a citywide survey of their sidewalks <clears throat> so that they know in advance of the condition or is it on an ad hoc basis where each homeowner contacts the town or there's perhaps a, uh, <clears throat> an incident that occurs and the homeowner gets flagged. How, what's the status? Yeah. You know, I don't know for certain, but I know that this program is mo mainly um, initiated by homeowners. Okay. They may do something else, um, you know, as well. And there are contractors and consultants that specialize in those type of inspections. And then uh, does San Rafael go ahead and pre-qualify a number of concrete contractors? Yeah, and I believe that, so they, I believe they had two and they actually got costs so that kind of up front you have an idea of, of before you submit a, submit an application of what it might cost or uh, before the work's done at least. So the contractor sort of agrees in advance that this is going to be what they'll charge mm -hmm. the, the maximum that the town has allowed mm -hmm. per square foot or whatever. Yeah. And uh, the, then if the town, I mean, if a homeowner wants to participate, they have to choose from a list of pre-qualified contractors. Is that... The way it's written, I think they have some preference between the two that um, submitted bids. Okay. Yeah. And do you know the total amount of money that San Rafael is going to allocate over the term of the project? Right. So they allocated $350,000 to this year. Obviously, they're um, quite a much larger city, and they've got quite a lot of sidewalk. Um, and, and if you go on their website, it, it has that $350,000 broken into specific areas. Um, you know, 150,000 a sidewalk, I believe, and then 75 to trees, and so they've they've subdivided it um, so that it's spent the way they want it to be. <laughs> and then, uh, Peter, do you do you know uh, if Corte Madera has sort of a townwide survey of sidewalk that needs attention, or is it again on sort of an ad hoc basis? We, I, I haven't seen a database that, that catalogs the condition of the sidewalks. And I, I came from the, the city of Santa Barbara, and we did have a comprehensive uh, sidewalk uh, database that, that ranked, I think we had 14 different categories. And we ranked you know, every, every section on either side of the street. Uh, we gave it a number between 1 and 14. And that, that way, we were able to kind of tackle uh, the highest priority or worst condition uh, sidewalks. I don't know that we have that in Corte Madera, but I also know that you know our sidewalks aren't in, in that bad of condition uh, in comparison. I think where you run into it is in 
you know, some areas where the slopes go up, uh, a lot of times the sidewalks go away. A lot of our hillside neighborhood, neighborhoods don't have any sidewalk at all. Uh, and so uh, what we have in our main conditions, our, RJ showed some photos, are trees uh, that impact our sidewalk as well as settlement. So a lot of our lower lying neighborhoods are dealing with settlement, which, which causes, you know, uh, uneven, uneven sidewalk. So uh, I think for simplicity's sake, we can probably do uh, some kind of cursory review to kind of hi highlight which areas we think are, are most in need. Uh, but, you know, I think initially my recommendation would be to follow the Center Fell model and have it be, uh, you know, initiated by the property owner. What happens right now, if there is uh, an incident, it, a property owner is served uh, with a, uh, you know, a code enforcement issue where they have a notice to repair. And so, you know, that's the way we're handling it now is, you know, once there's a complaint or a fall, uh, you know, that's, that's when it triggers some kind of action. So it would be nice to get ahead of that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, I guess kind of building, up, uh, <clears throat> building upon those questions, I'm curious if we've looked at any other communities that have taken a, a little more, I mean, I think this is a great idea and I think it's awesome we're looking at this, so, and I really appreciate the summary and it sounds like San Rafael is a pretty good uh, approach, um, but I think kind of to the question, um, it doesn't seem very as proactive as it could be, I mean, given that uh, if, for example, we had a survey of all the sidewalks and ranked them as they did in Santa Barbara, uh, I, I think this then we could uh, essentially m uh, identify those uh, property owners that do need to address their sidewalks. Um, the, this current, the current approach in San Rafael, um, I'm sure we're, you, some folks are having um, issues addressed that maybe personally have an issue with, but it doesn't necessarily uh, represent the public um, safety at, at, at as, as highly as it could if we were going after those that, that have an issue. So I guess just curious to know if, if we've looked at any other cities that have done that more proactive approach of doing an inventory of all the sidewalks, actually finding the ones that have issues and notifying the, the residents that, hey, you have an issue here, you're, you know, you're legally required to address it. And by the way, we're here to help you. Um, I think I could go a long ways. So I, I know from working at the county, they had a um, they had an ADA liaison, and he would accept con complaints from the public, and those would go on a list, and they would go through priorities. Um, so that was in lieu of this program that San Rafael has. Um, so you know, I don't know if that's you know we'd love your feedback on if you'd like that better, or if it should be some hybrid system, or you know, or what. Any other question? Uh, how does uh, San Rafael um, define uh, uh, the program or the eligibility for the so-called low income pool or lottery? Or, yeah. You know, I, I didn't get that um, specific off the web page, um, but yeah, we, let can, us we know. can look right. into it. Yeah. 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 My, my guess is they use the same uh, for housing. So, so housing, you know, the statewide numbers in terms of AMI area median income, they yeah. look at that, and then, you know, eighty percent or below is typically the the number for low income. So ballpark figure not holding anybody to any. But what does that mean? I mean, how, what are we talking about? Uh, well, a family of four uh, with a median income of eighty percent uh, below, or eighty percent of, of median income, income or less is. You know, it's in the you know, sub one hundred thousand per family for yeah. yeah. Okay. I think I'm. I was just. I, w I would be curious. I guess. Yeah. How would we proactively go after the um, probably the worst? Take a survey to know what the worst sidewalks are and start there. You know, but I, I fully support that there should be some methodology. Um, and this sounds sounds very interesting. Anyone else? Yeah. <clears throat> who, do you know who, um, how the project is handled? Is it handled uh, from beginning through end uh, by the homeowner, or does the? Uh, I think the city facilitates the process quite a bit. Yeah. So the project would project completion and such would. So they, you know, the homeowner would start the process by filling out an application and then being selected. But from then on, you know, they're walked through the, the process, including with, the, you know, facilitating any cost with contractors and inspections and that sort of thing. Okay. Mm -hmm. I have one. Other, oh, go ahead. Um, 
Is the sidewalk typically the homeowner's property or is that the city property? It's town property. Most of the time it's town right away, but our municipal code and the state uh, highways code says that it's the property owner's responsibility to maintain it. <laughs> so it's one of those tricky things. What, what is the logic behind that? I, not, not that we're here to question that. I'm just curious if I've ever asked how to explain that. Well, the logic is that, uh, you know, municipalities are, are primarily uh, responsible for curb to curb, right? So the right of way, which is defined in recorded maps, extends beyond uh, curb to curb. And, and sometimes, and oftentimes in our town, property owners build in the public right of way. The front of their yard is in the, what the recorded map says is a town right of way for that road. Uh, and so it's, it's a trade off. Uh, you know, we don't, you know, typically if, if that happens and we know about it, we ask for an encroachment permit, so we're aware of it. Uh, but at the same time, uh, you know, the, the town doesn't have the resources or the ability to maintain every stretch of pri uh, sidewalk on, on every, on every uh, property frontage. And so I think um, the way that that's written both in the municipal code and the state code is to strike a balance between, you know, property owners who may, you know, improve their yard mm. or, um, you know, like, like RJ said, they, they build a new driveway and they're responsible for that. Well, they're also responsible for ensuring that there aren't tripping hazards in front of their, in front of their walkway for the traveling public. So, sorry if I could. Um, so I'm just, correct me if I'm wrong, the, this approach is for property owners who want to fix their sidewalk and they, or they're seeking funding to do that versus what was in Santa Barbara where you're actually going out and identifying what needs it the most and regardless of whether that property owner is eager to pay for it or not. Well, what I would say about Santa Barbara is that the, the ranking system we used there was to go after grant funding and to, and to prioritize which projects were most in need. Uh, we could do the same thing in terms of like San Rafael's lottery program where, you know, if, if you're, let's say we have a, a five, five point system and if you're, you know, in the lowest ranking of the five categories and you apply in the lottery, you know, you get first choice uh, yep. or, you know, in, in the NBA lottery, you get eight balls instead of one. Uh, in, in the drawing. So there's lots of different ways to look at it. Uh, but having this discussion, I think, is helpful, especially when I think about, um, you know, RJ saying that the, the, the city of San Rafael leads the process and the amount of time and resources and staff that that would take to, for us to do um, would be a lot. And so that would be something that we'd have to definitely get uh, guidance and authorization from, you know, the town manager and town council to dedicate resources to do this. Um, but, you know, I think that doing an initial review uh, and you know we could probably do it in-house of determining where areas of town are most in need of improvement that that wouldn't be that difficult um, you know we don't have we don't have that much uh, that much <coughs> sidewalk uh, but again it's going to be the trees the trees for us are going to be the biggest thing and you know and that's why you know rj put up that slide that talked about what the town or the city of santa fell in this case is looking to put towards uh, maintaining or, or removing in some cases trees because you can repair sidewalks all day and if, if you don't do anything about the underlying cause of the sidewalk damage in many cases it's tree roots then you're not going to solve any long-term problem so mm -hmm. I had one last question I was curious what the participation rate has been with the San Rafael program are they uh, historically allotted all their funds are they so just curious this just that. got approved um, in October of okay. 2017, so it's, it's new. Okay, so they haven't implemented it. They're yeah. just doing their first round. Yeah. Okay. I'm just kind of curious to watch to see how much activity they get by not, mm -hmm. not taking a proactive approach. So do any members of the public want to comment on the sidewalk issue that's been presented? Mr. Robinson. Yes, thank you. Jim Robinson, Ash Avenue, Corte Madeira. Excuse me. <clears throat> the BPAC, I think, discussed this issue like four or five years ago, and Centerfell rolled out its program about a year ago, and I think it was uh, Chair McPherson that requested this item be on the agenda, so I appreciate that initiative, and also our new Public Works Director putting this on the, on the agenda this evening. Uh, with respect to history, the town at one time had a program, cost-sharing program. It wasn't highly successful. And uh, one of the issues I think members of the committee have already raised is the issue of is it going to be 
dealt with on a complaint basis or dealt with on an initiative basis. Mm -hmm. And I guess my concern would be that some people may not be aware of what is a hazard, what isn't a hazard. So I would suggest that there be some sort of uh, outreach and some provision of standards as to what is a hazard, what isn't a hazard, because there may be some that have these uh, tripping hazards in front of their, their homes are not aware of it. Uh, if you walk in my neighborhood, you can find many that are very visible. Uh, uh, the staff showed some uplifted sections. And one of the issues related to San Rafael is that uh, uh, they have an argument that uh, the city planted a lot of the trees in the public right of way. And as a result of that, the residents are feeling that it's the responsibility of the town rather than themselves. Although a recent court case, I think, upheld the decision and supported uh, the action of the city of San Rafael. Um, I've mentioned this ad nauseum, but uh, as a senior and a recent survey that was done by um, on behalf of seniors in the town of Corte Madera, which we are many, uh, the number one issue or concern uh, from residents identified was not housing issues, income issues, or recreation issues. It was safe sidewalks. That was their number one issue that they raised. And I recognize that I've been a staff member myself. There are many, many, many issues that our public works director, the town has to deal with. The question is, what are the most highest priorities? My concern is that in the program that San Rafael has implemented, uh, it only provides 50% of the cost up to $1,000. Now, I don't know, I haven't looked at costs of sidewalks, but I'm sure that, you know, I can go out and find some contractor. He'll tell me he'll do like two sections of my sidewalk for $1,000 very easily. So I don't know it's going to have a long, uh, a long, uh, 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 support and I would support rather spending five thousand dollars on a place where there are hazards opposed to someone where there's a limited hazard in front of someone's uh, home that the homeowner only feels is potential hazard so I think it'd be a good idea to, for the town to consider identifying uh, some uh, uh, measurement of what is a hazard and I know there are many that you can find in in city websites that show you know, the height of a sidewalk and what is a hazard, what isn't a hazard. And I think that uh, it would behoove the town, at least those the most egregious ones, to take a proactive approach and tell Jim Robinson if he has a section of his sidewalks a hazard to let him know that and uh, give him a certain number of days to at least respond as to how he's going to fix that. And I think it, this program, I think, will go along with sort of softening the blow of someone first understanding that, hey, the sidewalk's mine, and two, there's a hazard there. And I think that uh, if we can do that, uh, we may only solve a few hazard issues, but we also may eliminate a few uh, hazards that might result in claims against the town, which can be extremely expensive, as I know our own staff is certainly aware of. Um, bottom line is I hope that we'd be proactive, that uh, we would uh, identify uh, uh, what is a what is a hazard uh, and I think that uh, if the town intends to implement such a program I would hope that they would provide some level of funding that will at least provide some impetus and some incentive for uh, people to take advantage of it thank you very much thank you anyone else from the public Cindy Winter, I have a legal question. If the town owns the underlying property and the sidewalk is a hazard and the town tries to persuade the homeowner to fix that hazard and the homeowner doesn't and somebody trips and falls and is badly injured, where is the legal liability? I'm just curious. <laughs> So, you know, Cindy, we're, we can't respond with legal opinions, but the minutes can be reviewed by town council, and <laughs> perhaps she can respond. So if there's no other members of the public, let's go ahead and have a quick discussion and see if we can uh, set this up for, for uh, future BPAC. Uh, I have, a, I guess, a, a question, if I may, before the comment, which is, um, is any of this problem susceptible to... Zillow, that is, can you, is Zillow accurate enough to see hazards? Or like Google Maps? Or Google. Well, or whatever, yeah, yeah, I, yeah, I didn't mean to. Uh, I would think on uh, the most severe, sure, you could see it on Google Earth, but 
you know, when you're getting down to half an inch, I would say probably not. Well, I, I use Zillow because that's often somewhat more detailed in its uh, image because people are literally buying houses off of it. Mm -hmm. So I only raise the question as to making this somewhat more, somewhat easier. <clears throat> Probably more fun to walk the neighborhoods, though. Than you think? Oh, okay. Fine. <laughs> 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 I thought it would just be in order. <laughs> Some of the consultants that do this for a living actually use segways. <laughs> ah. <laughs> okay. Fun fact. Good you, enough for me. You mean consultants that, that survey the condition of streets and sidewalks? Yes. Use that bomb. because. Yeah. One, they can cover more ground, but yep. two, it's it's highly sensitive to uh, to. Um, I think it's just covering more ground okay. mainly. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. So, you know, this is as Jim Robinson said, this is something that we've been talking about for for many years, and uh, <coughs> funding is obviously a, a big issue, but just conceptually, as a policy, you know, I think the B pack as a whole. Would, would want to look at this as more proactive. We applaud San Rafael for what they're doing, but I'd really love to see a town-wide survey with objective criteria so that then the town could say, <clears throat> based upon uh, you know, these 14 different objective uh, uh, criteria, we can, we can grade it, let's say, one to 10. And, and 10, obviously, you know, would be a, uh, very severe uh, dangerous condition and one would be nominal. And then I think you could, we could have a policy if the, if the town council agrees with this approach after getting input from the public where the town would, would allocate a certain amount of money and the town would then let people know that had, uh, let's say, uh, sidewalk conditions from a four to a ten know that uh, they, the town has a policy of cost sharing. That program is going to exist for 18 months to 24 months or whatever it is. And if you take advantage of it, uh, then it's going to be cost sharing. If you fail to, to participate, <laughs> then the town's going to flag you and require you to do it at your own nickel, something like that. And the people in the one to four would you know, then be queuing up for the future. They could do it on their own or they could do it uh, in the future. But I think it addresses the, the public safety standpoint uh, in a much more proactive way. And the final comment that I would make is, it, it seems to me that, you know, maybe this is just, I, I think that I could sell this to contract, uh, concrete contractors, but if you had four or five concrete, concrete contractors who felt that they were going to be pre-qualified and in, in line for the work, Part of what I would think the town might be able to do is to ask them and convince them that their employees would go out and use the standards that Santa Barbara <coughs> uses, and they go out and develop the, the survey and come back to the town and say, okay, we had, you know, you divide it up into to neighborhoods and perhaps the contractors do the survey for the town, uh, walking around with their segways or their iPads and just checking off, taking a photograph, checking off, taking a photograph. And I, I would think if you had three or four contractors doing that that were in line for the work, it would cost them very little. It would not take up time on the staff's part, and it would generate uh, uh, a database that would be then very helpful uh, if the town council sort of green-lighted at least some preliminary approach to this. So I'd like to see this continue to come back to the BPAC uh, as an agenda item. And as we chip away at it. Okay. Anything else? All right. Let's move on to the next uh, discussion. Project updates, and and uh, Mr. Parisi and and uh, Director Brown are going to talk to us about the Tamil Tamil Vista Complete Streets Project. <coughs> Vice Chair. Uh, Nick Pearson, uh, item six is committee member reports. I know we oh, haven't I'm gotten together in a while, but we may want to just check in and see if anyone has any reports or... Thank you. I, I jumped right over that. I do not. I'll, I'll say hi to Bob. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, I hope you're feeling well. Um, and the pizza's for everybody. 
um, help yourself. I think the Mill Valley pizza is winning. Um, there's a Mill Valley special and a Corte Madera classic. Um, the Mill Valley is winning in terms of, I think you and I are the only ones eating the pizza right now. So anyway, that's my report. I have a quick, oh, go ahead. Nothing new. I have a quick item. <clears throat> I had a, I had reached out to the BPAC members uh, prior to this meeting, um, just trying to get some more information about an uh, incident that happened, an uh, incident that happened in late May uh, on Tamapayas Drive. A uh, pedestrian was crossing uh, using the, the flashing beacons uh, at uh, Lakeside um, and uh, was struck by a, a motor vehicle. Uh, the, this uh, pedestrian was taken to in general uh, with some, I guess, some pretty major injuries, not, not life-threatening, but serious, uh, it was serious enough. And um, I was curious uh, if the city had any more details about that uh, situation. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> thank you, uh, Committee Member Christensen. So I read the police report. Uh, it was 6.30 in the afternoon in May, and uh, the vehicle that struck the pedestrian was, was westbound into the setting sun and, and that was noted uh, both by the driver and in the police report as a significant contributor to the incident. Um, the pedestrian activated the flashing beacon, uh, looked uh, to see that the vehicles were yielding in three of the four lanes, all the vehicles were yielding and as the pedestrian stepped off the curb, the car closest to it in the, I guess it'd be the number two lane in the westbound direction, uh, was approaching and the pedestrian assumed that the vehicle would stop and and the vehicle didn't stop until it was too late uh, and so um, you know f per the vehicle code that is the fault of the driver uh, the pedestrian was not at fault but the pedestrian as you noted you know had a broken shoulder and 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 some some uh, i think abrasions and lots of other uh you know not fun things to go through but he's okay he, he's he's um he's come around uh, and then in full disclosure, there was an, an email question that came out about uh, potential changes that the town could do to the intersection design. And we did look into that. Uh, Jared and I were out there this morning measuring some of the signs. Uh, I know one of the suggestions was maybe we move the flashing beacon to the center median or add an additional flashing beacon in the center median. And uh, you know, I think for wide roadways or roadways with wider medians, that, that's actually a good idea. And it's uh, uh, per the um, Manual for Uniform Traffic Control Devices, it's allowed. Uh, however, in this particular case, we have a three foot median and the actual width of the sign that we're looking at end to end is around 50 inches. And so what we end up doing is having a sign that overhangs the median in the roadway and then we end up you know, having a liability issue with cars or trucks or side view mirrors, you know, hitting that sign. Um, and, you know, because this particular incident wasn't, I would say, attributable to poor design, I think that my recommendation would be to leave the intersection as is, but to remind everyone that, you know, the flashing beacon is a nice thing, but it's not, you know, it's not armor. Uh, and I haven't been hit by a car since I was about six years old because I don't step into the roadway until I'm 100% <laughs> sure that no one is going to strike me. Uh, so it's really the responsibility of the pedestrian to make sure that it's uh, clear uh, to cross. And, you know, we're, we're always interested in safety. It's, it's our number one charge in the Public Works Department, so we'll continue to look at this and other issues. No, I appreciate the background and um, for looking into that and considering those recommendations. Um, one thing I just wanted to clarify is um, there was also a question about the uh, the, ra the radar sign uh, is in the center median um, and seems to be in conflict with, uh, is that typical to put a, a radar sign on a crosswalk given that the, you want the driver to be focused on the crosswalk and any uh, and, and having a radar sign there could be perceived as a distraction um, and might be more appropriate in a mid block location where there is nothing particularly that they need to be looking for. Yeah, that's a fair comment. Uh, I think that we can look into that. One of the nice things about um, the bases for those uh, radar, solar powered radar speed limit signs is they're, they're movable. Yeah. Uh, so we'll look into that. Cool. Yeah. Thanks. And, and just a reminder to members if an incident occurs before a BPAC meeting and you'd like to have that incident agendized so that uh, people in the public who are in the neighborhood can uh, attend and uh, Public Works can uh, prepare and, and um, 
determine what responses are appropriate, that's, that's the best way to get a full discussion. So if there's no other committee member reports, we'll go ahead to David Parisi and Director Brown on the Tamil Vista Complete Streets project. Thank you, Vice Chair McPherson. I just wanted to note uh, a couple of folks in the room uh, that have been working on this. Jared Berrio of our staff, as well as uh, Rich Sosa and David Parisi, the four of us have been uh, putting our heads together uh, since Kelly Crow left us, and we've been continuing to improve the design. And so, uh, you know, I think David's going to come up to the mic and, and give us kind of an overview. Jared, will you pull up that slideshow real quick? And, uh, and you know, I mentioned this when we all met a, a few months ago, uh, that this is uh, an opportunity for us to uh, really do a safety enhancement, a multimodal uh, transportation enhancement on the corridor uh, of Tamil Vista between Madera and Pfeiffer. And, uh, you know, the pavement condition just so happens to be not that good out there. And so I like the fact that we have the opportunity to uh, address, you know, pavement condition, pedestrian safety in terms of how they move along and across the roadway. We do not have bike lanes in this corridor. Uh, I think they're needed. Uh, and so, um, you know, this is an exciting opportunity that uh, maybe 12 to 18 months from now uh, we could see uh, begin. Uh, so, David, we want to walk us through that. Sure, happy to. Um, good evening, um, committee members. I'm David Parisi, traffic engineer, civil engineer. I'm joined by Rich uh, Souza, civil engineer, who's also working on the project. We've been hard at work for, for many months. Uh, we're looking at Tamil Vista Boulevard between uh, Madera Boulevard and Pfeiffer Avenue. It's about 3,000 feet long. Um, there was uh, some grants that had been given to the town uh, to look at this and design it. Um, and those grants did stipulate bike lanes in each direction where, where feasible, so that will be part of the project. Does this, uh, do I need to do anything special? Is it work? No. <laughs> so tonight I'm going to talk about two segments of the street because they are slightly different, and that is uh, between um, Madeira and Warnham, which I'm calling the southern, southern segment. I'll start there and then we'll move up between Warnham and Pfeiffer. So this stretch of um, uh, Tamil Vista is between 41 and 42 feet wide uh, on average between the curb faces. And these photos show a couple of the existing conditions. The photo on the left is looking on the west side of the street toward uh, Madera Boulevard. And there we have some uh, sidewalks that don't meet ADA, uh, f drainage issues, and um, other, other concerns. You can see on the photo on the right side, it's the same similar section. It's across the street from the theater where the pavement actually is in pretty poor condition. Um, you can see a drainage inlet that um, we're going to try to replace all the grates on those to make them uh, friendlier as well. Next, next slide. These are, uh, the top is, is kind of how it looks today. Again, that segment between Madera and Warnham, about 41 to 42 feet wide. There's some places where there's just one lane each direction and other locations where there's three lanes, where there's a center two-way left turn lane. The proposal on this segment is to actually restripe the roadway to narrow the lanes just a little bit to 10 feet in width the through travel lanes so that we can accommodate uh, bicycle lanes in each direction. And this was, uh, has been long planned for the last few years. There's been some designs that came before the feedback uh, to look at this and a lot of feedback that you provided at that time. Um, the design would not reduce the capacity of the roadway whatsoever. It actually, these 10-foot lanes would be um, wonderful because they could, it'd help reduce those high speeds when you hit somebody who's going 45, 50 miles an hour. It'll help bring folks into compliance with the actual speed limit. Next slide, please. Uh, some other uh, things we're going to be looking at is fixing some of the drainage issues. As noted, the, um, you know, on, on the west side of the street, just north of Madera, uh, there are some um, um, settling issues, sidewalk uh, concerns as well. But there's also parking on that side of the street. Actually, 93% of the street has no parking along it. But 7% does. And it's really all in this location on the west side uh, in front of about seven or eight homes. That parking will need to be eliminated. It's been discussed for some time, but that is an issue we need to bring up every single time. There'll be red curb placed on the street, and parking spaces will need to be uh, removed along the, the remaining 7% of the street. Next slide. 
I'm going to jump to the north, uh, north of Warnham, where the street gets a little skinnier. It's only 40 feet wide uh, between curbs. And the land uses are, are a little bit different, right? On the uh, west side, we have some uh, apartments and, and commercial and office. And on the east side, we have, we have a lot of commercial and new apartments. Currently, there's about two, 12, uh, two 14 foot traffic lanes and a 12 foot wide two way left turn lane, which is heavily used by cars turning southbound left onto to Warnham, by MMWD vehicles going into their sites on either side of the roadway, as well as left turn lane going into uh, Pfeiffer. So, what we're proposing is there's just enough room to fit in, retain the three lanes and the minimum bike lane width. There are two <coughs> foot pans, two foot gutters out here, so the minimum bikeway width that we can uh, <coughs> um, use is, is five feet in width. So there's just enough room uh, to get this in. Next slide. Some conditions on this segment of the street include driveways and some of the crossings that are not ADA compliant. The project will replace curb ramps that are not compliant. We're looking at sidewalk uh, repairs where they can be made within the budget. And then also along the street, interestingly enough, there's, there's these four bus pullouts, which in the heyday must have been very, very popular, but there's only three bus routes or three buses a day now going on the street, mostly to serve Redwood High School. Uh, I think one in the morning and two in the afternoon. Ridership is incredibly small uh, at these bus stops. So we're actually proposing to retain the bus stops, but bring the curb out and do some things with some, uh, uh, some greening in these areas, some nice opportunities to add, add some features to the narrow street. Next slide. And you can see that uh, on this slide here. Uh, here's the location uh, where there is, right in front of MMWD, we're seeing um, a lot of opportunities here to provide some greening zones, continue to provide the bus stops in those areas. When the buses do stop for their short duration, they'll take the lane for a few seconds uh, and then go on. Uh, but you can also see that we have, a, have an opportunity here at the MMWD crosswalk, instead of pedestrians having to cross three lanes and find a gap in both directions of the traffic, pr provision of a um, refuge island, where a pedestrian crosses one stream of traffic at a time, is forced, because of the diagonal in the island, to look at oncoming traffic before they cross in the other direction. So this will connect both sides of MMWD. Um, there is, uh, I believe, four uncontrolled crosswalks across Tamil Vista between Madeira and Pfeiffer. Um, similar to on Tamil Pius, we're, we're proposing to eliminate one of them that's close to another one, but retain three uh, crosswalks. Two of them would have rectangular rapid flashing beacons, including this one here. Uh, <coughs> we show on these plans uh, another location where we found an opportunity to provide another pedestrian refuge island. So we'll do all we can to put in um, features such as uh, new signage, yield lines, rectangular rapid flashing beacons, and other uh, measures to really make the street a better street, not just for cyclists to cross and motorists to drive at the speed limit, but also for um, um, uh, pedestrians. Next slide. Some other features, we know that this uh, it's, it's a tough connection sometimes coming off the Sandra Marker Trail and heading south onto the street where there is no bike lane. Uh, we've found an opportunity within the town right away to um, actually increase the landing zone. We are coming off of uh, Sandra Marker, that's shown in this bottom concept here, to actually have a bigger area so you're not shot right out into the road. And as a matter of fact, um, we're looking at providing a left turn lane in the westbound, or the northbound direction for bikes to get onto the Sandra Marker Trail. Because right now it's pretty awkward. You have to go to the right, a lot of dry, cyclists go to the right side, uh, uh, to the east side of the road, get off their bike, and then come across the crosswalk. There is, there's enough room to do this, so we're excited about it. Um, it'll enable, again, cyclists to be able to have their own little uh, left turn lane. Next slide. This is not part of the project yet. We're taking donations, but we've, <laughs> we're trying to find an opportunity to see, to make sure that whatever's done with this project does not preclude the potential uh, provision in the future of a modern roundabout. Nice. And we have determined that, lo and behold, it can fit within the town's right of way. Wow. And we've done some preliminary design that's shown right here on, on the bottom right. Um, it could be very, very nice. It could be a nice gateway treatment for the town, kind of announce, announce you're in the Corte Madera. Um, lots of benefits that this would provide. First off, it would reduce delays. Secondly, we do believe it would increase pedestrian and cyclist safety. There have been some, uh, some pedestrians that have been hit 
in the crosswalk going across Madera Boulevard where there can be some confusion and, and long, long crosswalks. A modern roundabout allows pedestrians to cross, again, one-legged tr traffic at a time using the splitter island uh, intermediately uh, along their walk. And then also, um, we can design this so that cyclists riding from Madera Boulevard onto Tamil Vista in the direction north-south can actually, uh, the, the more uh, confident riders can take the road, Others can actually ride up onto a pathway and around the roundabout and then back into, into the street. There's enough room to do it and do it right and make it quite attractive. And the picture on top is, is kind of an example of, of how it could look. I'm sure that if this got some legs, there's going to be a lot of folks that want to input on some of the features, hardscape and, and landscape of, of a roundabout. Next slide. Uh, our schedule, we've been, been hard at work. We're making really good progress. Uh, we're past the 30% design stage. We'll continue through the fall working on the designs, getting input from uh, groups like yours. And the, the intent is uh, early next year to start the bidding process and get this thing out to construction next spring. Um, Peter, you may want to talk about this. I think you're a little more familiar with the, the budget than I am. Yeah, so uh, thanks, David, for that presentation. This is the last slide. So w what we've done is we've just kind of incorporated um, the capital improvement program, which was approved by town council two days ago. And uh, these are the numbers that are in there. Uh, as David mentioned, uh, a, a good proportion of this is grant funds. Uh, and so we, you know, we have uh, a directive from, uh, from the granting agencies. I think there's multiple grants that are, that are involved here. Uh, to get this project built and then the rest of it the town will contribute and make up for so um, uh, that we've done a preliminary cost estimate and I think uh, Rich uh, Souza spent a lot of time uh, on that and you know it's it's around a two million dollar project uh, and so you know right now as of Tuesday night uh, the town has budgeted funds to complete this and so that's that's exciting for us um, you know, I was hoping that the roundabout could also be built within that $2 million budget, <laughs> uh, but that may not, may not happen, but we can also seek other funds for that, um, that particular project. I think the two, the two go hand in hand, the corridor enhancement and then inter the specific intersection enhancement. Um, and so we're happy to take any questions uh, that the BPAC may have. Did, was Rich going to provide any additional comments before? I think he should, just because he's here. <laughs> well, from the civil, um, from what I looked at at the civil point of view, I looked at the pavement, the cross slopes, all the stuff that you were talking about earlier about the sidewalks. So what we looked at was really, I, what do you have ADA compliancy out there? I mean, where do you ha where you don't do and don't have it? And one thing you'll see at the south end of there, there's a lot of those residential driveway approaches. And in fact, a lot of most all of those driveway approaches out there aren't compliant. So especially when you get in the south end, where those driveways are really crunched in on each other, you have this up and downsy deal. And when you you know you're a senior citizen, or even if you have a bad back going up and down, that's just a hard way to get through. So what we're going to try to do is get at least a minimum four foot path of travel through uh, walkway. Path. If we can, we'll get a buffer, right? So we have done a survey of the area already, so we have a good idea where the, the property lines are at, and we're working to figure out the best solution because some of those are really tight. Uh, we've worked with Kelly and, and Jared on trying to, maybe we have to do a roll curb in situations, but we have enough information to keep moving on. We also looked at the pavement sections uh, going through the road. So uh, we're working with Miller Pacific. They've gone out, done some quarrying out there, and if you'll see that the sections that the cross slopes of the road they get up to eight nine percent in some of those areas and that's not uncommon with a, a street that's been out there for a while it had some overlays that have been done historically and then they wedge grind the ends to tie into the existing curb and and so what you see is the slope starts building up right so we're working to figure out a section that would um, that the best optimal section to grind down the top uh, you got some bay muds down there. You got some high groundwater conditions, so we might have to bring in a pavement fabric and then build it up with some AC again. Something that's uh, working. So when we did our estimate, I mean, I I, tr I assumed those things would be included in into our scope. We also looked at drainage. Um, there are some homes out there um, that do have. You just see these little two-inch lines kind of sneaking in back there. So we we walk the whole site just to make sure we can try to find those drainage. So if we're going to do a driveway approach and there's a sidewalk right there we got to make sure we're not precluding any type of drainage that's out there as well so uh, a 
couple of questions. I noticed that the, the south of Warnham, the center lane was marked out, proposed at nine foot, whereas north of Warnham was proposed at 10 foot. And I'm wondering if we can't keep them both nine foot given the infrequency of, of their use and whether nine foot can accommodate it. So we're still working that out. You know, we also know that there are certain places where the left turning movements in and out of that lane are heavier than other locations. So for instance, um, you know, in front of um, uh, the DMV and uh, that whole area where um, Tamil Pie's pizza place, yep. you know, uh, to the north there's heavier volumes as well. Okay. Uh, but south part, the volumes are very low. It's just into individual residential driveways. So we're still working that out. Um, we'll take that under consideration. It's also a compromise between how wide the bike lane can be. So, okay. And um, I was struck with the diagonal crosswalk going to the refuge island as being something I've never seen before. But the moment you see it, it it's, it's, it's brilliant. I mean, it makes so much sense. Is that something that's relatively new in the past five to 10 years? Oh, I don't know. It's, when there's an opera, we've, we've been designing these for probably the last 10, 10 plus years. Um, you've seen some recently installed in, in Novato. Um, if you can do them, you want to do them in this direction so you're facing traffic and not the other other direction. You can't always build them. It, can, it, has, it depends on site conditions, but there's an opportunity. It does require moving where pedestrians are starting to cross the street in front of MMWD a little bit, but actually I think it's more in direction of, of travel. And then are these slides available uh, to members of the BPAC if, if we wanted to show particularly neighbors in that area to try and get additional buy-in, or is this sort of a draft that's not available yet? I'll turn back to city staff for that question. Yeah, we'll, we'll post this, uh, this slideshow up on the website. So yeah, this is public, so anyone can take a look at it. And I also invite, um, you know, the BPAC members, you know, perhaps when the meeting's over, to take a more detailed look at the plans that are on the wall. Um, as David mentioned, you know, we're looking at approaching the 30% design, so we'll continue to refine these. Uh, you know, I wouldn't, I wouldn't get too hung up if you see something you really like or don't like on those because, you know, they're in a pretty draft form at this point. And then I think my final question is when do we continue to keep this uh, each BPAC uh, meeting as an agenda item so that we continue to get uh, town input from, from uh, citizens or do we go skip a meeting and go into the winter or fall? My suggestion would be we skip we skip the August meeting. We'll have a few other items to talk about, uh, yeah. and then that'll give us, you know, come October, December, uh, we could certainly give you our latest and greatest at that point. Perfect. Yeah. Any other questions from members of the BPAC? Mm -hmm. uh, <coughs> I'm curious, do the people who own property where there's currently a parking place on the street, do they know that these plans, or when will they find out these <laughs> plans remove that parking space from the street? When they start turning into BPAC meetings, uh, they're going to find out. We're going to have to do some official notification. Of course, you know, we haven't adopted the plans. We haven't gotten to that point. Uh, but I, I do hear you, and that's why I put it up on that slide. So the eight homes uh, that are currently have red curb, uh, seem to be getting along just fine in that section and then the six homes that approach uh madera uh, are the ones in fact the one in the corner is already red curb so it's actually the six homes uh, that are just to the north of madera uh, are going to have a new condition and I, I imagine that some of them won't be very excited about it uh, but when we weigh the overall cost benefit of the public safety improvement here um, I, I believe that i have a, a case to make to council to make the decision that that um, you know, red curbing in front of those six homes is really important for the traveling public and for the safety of the community. But but I hear you. I think we should, uh, you know, let them know. It's 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 a little tricky to say. You know, we haven't gone out to bid. We don't have 100% plans. Nothing's been adopted by council. But we think you know you, there may be red curb in front of your home in late 2019. Uh, I don't know what your suggestion is for when when you uh, actually serve them a notice or mail them a notice. Uh, but for me, it would be, you know, probably at least four to six months notice before it happens. So just to point out, these are the six homes. So David, you have to use a microphone. You're welcome to grab the one from Rich, and Rich can hand it to you, but we're on, we're recording everything. 
And so everyone must be mic'd. Thank you for that. Okay. Um, so I'm just going to point to the, uh, the map here. As Peter mentioned, the six homes, there are these six homes. Two, three, four, five, six. And then the rest, as you're heading north, actually have red curb in front of them already, all the way up to the other Council Crest and beyond. Oh, yeah, I had a, uh, first off, you know, this is fantastic that you found funding for this and got the council approved, so, you know, congratulations. That, this will be a huge, huge benefit to this corridor. Um, you know, I think the roundabout's a really interesting idea and a really cool one, and uh, hopefully you can find the resources to cover it. Um, so my, I guess my question is, is in regards to um, how this project relates to, to Wind Cup and you know, what kind of resources were provided uh, as part of the agreement with the city when that was built and um, are any of those resources being used to, uh, to fund this given the, the traffic implications of that new development? Yeah. Um, and, and sorry, and <clears throat> if not, uh, the, the roundabout might, uh, might, might be a great way to uh, fund it might be to, to leverage some Wind Cup funds. Yeah. So, um, committee member Christensen, so we, we call it Tam Ridge now. I know oh, that back in the day it had a different name. I was trying to remember uh, the proper but name. The but Tam Ridge <laughs> Apartments, I believe, and don't quote me exactly, but I'm, I'm pretty sure on the ballpark number, it's around two hundred and or $250,000 that they contributed. Uh, I know that some of that money, uh, as discussed with council, was to go to a traffic study to look at the impacts uh, of, uh, you know, what's happening on that corridor before and after, you know, the project is built and, and occupancy is up. Uh, we can still do that study. You know, my recommendation is going to be that that money contribute to this project. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think there's definitely a clear nexus to the transportation improvements that we could do on this corridor. Uh, and so, you know, as, as council adopted uh, the entire budget in the capital improvement program and with our next year's budget, the specifics of what pieces go into each of those components um, are kind of deeper in the budget. But yeah, that, that money, I've been looking at it and I think it's definitely a good use uh, for this location. Great, thank you. Um, I don't know much, sorry, I realize I turned this off. I don't know much about the Corte Madera Beautification Committee, but it's occasionally I know they get in and do certain things that make the town look very nice and pretty. And that roundabout seems to be <laughs> something that would fall into that category and I also have heard that they get significant resources from their um, annual event so I don't know if that there's any coordination that can happen there I don't know how that works not to date but I guess maybe there will be now that you brought it up <laughs> <laughs> maybe as well as for the uh, the bus stop zones that we, we find an opportunity to do some greening so if there are no additional questions, we can open it up to the public for any comments. Uh, Jean Seringhouse, thank you. Um, great presentation, nice shiny project. <laughs> we, we were talking about this before and it was like, how much m land are we gonna require the hotel to give up so that we can have um, protected bike lanes here or buffered bike lanes here. And I would love to hear a little bit more about what's happened with that. And also, um, I don't know if you have a slide of uh, going northbound from, um, from the Madeira intersection um, where the hotel is on the right. Do you have a slide of that? So if you, okay, so you look at the map. Um, so when I'm biking north from that intersection, that's the worst stretch of the whole street for me is that curb because cars just gun it either around the, the corner coming from the freeway or going north along there. And the centripetal force can push them out into the um, drain area. And so I will, if I'm feeling vulnerable, I will ride on that sidewalk, which has many large um, utility poles in it. So I would love it if you could address um, what you've planned to do with that sidewalk and those utility poles and the possibility for a buffer there. Um, the second one is a piece about the wind cup money and there was an original thought that that was gonna go to um, fixing all the, the tree roots um, wrecking the class one path by the DMV across from wind cup. So I'd love to hear what happened to that too, please.
Cindy Winter, I agree that this whole project looks very promising. And I do really like the idea of that left turn lane onto the Sandra Marker Trail when one is proceeding southbound. I do that at least once or twice a week. I always make my own left turn lane. No matter what's there, I've got it figured out. And so have a lot of other cyclists. So it's happening. And if you can adjust the pavement markings to reality, I think that would be a good thing to do. And the second point I'd like to make is a question. When you have a curb cut, there's often a lip between the street surface and the end of the slope that goes down to meet the street. And I've always much preferred that there be no lip because it's easier if your bike is at an angle to turn into that curb cut and, and not have a bump and you're, you're not going to hit that lip at the wrong angle. But then I met an engineer about a year or two ago, and he assured me most solemnly that one does need a substantial lip, and I never understood it. So we have some engineers here, and maybe they can explain. Thank you. Thank you. Jim Robinson, Ash Avenue, Corte Madeira. Um, I guess I understand the dilemma of staff and BPAC, but my suggestion would be to advise the residents sooner rather than later they're going to lose their parking. You know, and anywhere anyone lives in Corte Madera, we have this phenomenon where no one wants to use their garage for its intended purpose, and our cars sit on the driveway or they sit out in the street. Um, with respect to Tamil Vista, I think it's a great project. I think it's well thought out. And I used to walk Tamil Vista, but I was always fearful of A, the speed of the vehicles, and B, uh, Many times the bicycles would uh, change the roadway for the sidewalk, and I find myself facing a bicycle going 25, 30 miles an hour, and I'm walking three or four miles an hour. Um, whenever you eliminate parking, though, you're going to find this parking is going to go somewhere else. So we should be prepared to deal with that. And if I could just use one example of we uh, have a street in Madeira Gardens. I think it's the Apache or Navajo. I may not have my Indian street names correct mm -hmm. here, but uh, we have uh, when school is in session, anywhere between 15 and 20 cars that park there. Many of them have stickers from Redwood High School, but for some reason they park there and then cross over the uh, Santa Marker Trail to go to the high school. It's a bit of a hike, but uh, for whatever reason. So I inquired of the principal at the high school, and apparently they issue more permits than they have parking at Redwood High School. In fact, I went over and looked at the site on the day I talked to the principal, and I found there were no available student parking at the parking lot, but there were some 58 vacant spaces for the teachers and faculty and staff. So whenever you have an imbalance, you're going to find a problem. And as well as imbalance at Redwood High School, they now have parking on a permanent basis during the school hours uh, in Madeira Garden. So I guess I would be concerned about where these people are going to park and what corresponding problems that might create for other neighbors uh, in the neighborhood. But I think uh, I applaud the staff and the consultants for their design. I'm a little still interested on how that's going to connect with the uh, roundabout at that uh, location and how that's that's going to work but uh, uh, thanks for letting me make some input okay <clears throat> any further discussion before we move on to the next item yeah yeah that's a good idea yeah, let's, let's go ahead and do that um, I can address a, a couple of the questions um, Gene asked about cyclists riding northbound north of uh, Madeira. That's something we can we can look at. What the plans are showing right now are six foot wide bike lanes in each direction, but also a nine foot center left turn lane. So within that 41 feet, um, you know we can look at striping and maybe a very uh, narrow buffer in that area. I will say that on the the sidewalk on the east side. Um, there are no or very limited improvements suggested at this stage uh, between um, TD Ameritrade and up to, um, up to Warnham, except for some potential ADA improvements where there's tripping hazards. The reason being is that this area is being reserved for a future phase um, for part of the streetscape plan that's been worked on by the planning department for the last couple of years. We're looking at different options to provide perhaps a class one path along that side between, um, again, Madeira 
in Warnham or a class four facility or a wider sidewalk. There's a number of options that are still being considered and that would not be part or funded as part of this plan, but as projects, re you know, sites redevelop over time. Um, there's also the question about curb ramps and the lips on curb ramps. Sometimes there's lips on curb ramps to facilitate drainage flow around, around the drain, around, around the uh, flow line. But uh, the, the lips cannot be more than a quarter inch in height these days. So you will see lots of new ones that are just very flush or maybe it's a tiny, tiny little bit of a lip. So um, as the curb ramps get rebuilt, you'll see that there's no, no lips or it's very, very, very minor. Anything you wanted to add, Peter? I'll add a few things. Thanks for that, um, David. So, um, yeah, just to kind of reiterate, one of the intentions that we got into with this uh, streetscape improvement was really to focus on the curb to curb improvements we could do and then adding sidewalk improvements on the west side. Uh, you know, as David mentioned, we intentionally, intentionally left off the east side because of the fact that the commercial properties along the east side have a high potential for redevelopment. Uh, we wanted to make sure that anything we did do in the right of way uh, would not be lost on a future phase two project. So we are, we are definitely keeping that in mind. And, and I do think that, you know, as David mentioned, the planning department and a lot of the neighborhood, uh, you know, discussion and vision is for an enhanced widened sidewalk or class one pathway on the east side. So this, the, the good thing about this project is we can get an immediate improvement in the next, you know, 12 to 18 months uh, and then still have that. Uh, that really is contingent. Much of those improvements on the east side are contingent on the redevelopment of those properties, and so this, this project won't preclude those. Uh, in terms of, you know, whether or not we dedicate the, the money from Tam Ridge, uh, you know, traffic mitigation uh, toward this project, which, as you know, is a two-plus million dollar project, or towards improving Warnham Drive, uh, a class one pathway, that's a much less expensive project, and, and we do have some other funds we can, we can apply to that project. So, you know, from an overall cost-benefit analysis, it makes more sense, you know, fr from my standpoint at least, to put it on this project, and I don't think it uh, hurts us from improving uh, the condition of the Warnham Class 1. Uh, and then, you know, I, I hear what you're saying about advising the property owners. You know, the only, the only caution to that is, is, you know, it's tough to advise them of something that may or may not happen. We don't, we don't know. And so um, what I'll do based on the feedback I've gotten from the public and, and the committee is to let them know at the earliest possible date uh, once we're, um, you know, further along. Um, so, uh, yeah, that's all I have. Good. All right. <clears throat> so let's go ahead and move on to uh, uh, B, the Redwood Highway multi-use pathway. All right, so um, I'll introduce this item and then I'll turn it over to Jared. Uh, so the, many of you know the, the Redwood Highway uh, multi-use pathway. It's a class one pathway, it's existing, and uh, it, does, it does have some issues. So it's not in the best condition. Uh, I've ridden it on my bike a few times uh, lately, and I can attest to the fact that it's in need of attention. Uh, but the good thing is we've begun to design and address those issues and uh, we're again working with Robert and Ty Day, and, and as well as um, Jared, on, on those improvements. And so Jared can kind of walk us through uh, what we're looking at, what the project limits are, and, and when you might see that, that pathway improved. All right, thank you, Peter. So I'm gonna talk about three different project updates, uh, one after the other. So we'll start with the Redwood Highway multi-use pathway. So it's a class one rehabilitation project currently going from Warnham over to San Clemente. Um, I'm sure most of you are familiar with the path. It's east of the village and east of the 101 corridor, west of the marsh. So the existing conditions aren't that great, as you might be aware. Uh, we have pedestrian ramps that aren't ADA compliant. We have pavement conditions of various qualities. And we also have tree roots that uh, are pretty uh, prohibitive at several locations along the length of it, and I'll get into that a little bit more in detail in a couple minutes. So a proposed cross-section here uh, shows about an eight foot, at least eight feet of a multi-use trail, uh, similar to the function that currently is there, but a little bit wider, about 3,600 lineal feet of, of pavement. Um, <clears throat> We are studying potentially getting wider 
uh, at some spots, and um, the eight feet does not include two feet of uh, shoulder on each side. Um, the project also includes eight new pedestrian ramps. About the tree root conflict, um, this is at the gravel lot just north of the village parking. Um, there's, there's several mature, tr mature trees lining the pathway at this uh, in particular, and uh, the, the pavement's pretty rippled and deteriorated around that area. So our recommendation moving forward is to get an arborist uh, to advise us. Um, some number of trees will be removed uh, and replanted with a more appropriate species for the area, lower root systems and uh, less destructive on our path. Um, and then another item is the, the Tamil Vista project that was just previously discussed is gonna be a lot of pavement uh, planned for summer of next year in 2019. So uh, one, one item we're looking at is coordinating this pathway construction, the pavement work uh, in, in unison with, with that work uh, to, for economy of scale. Moving on. Uh, so, Jared, let's, since we have these listed as separate items, we'll go ahead and pause and, okay. and get uh, comments or uh, from the from BPAC or questions from the public on the uh, Redwood Highway multi-use pathway. So, the only question that I have is about um, the <clears throat> uh, improvements that are going to happen to the gravel <clears throat> lot in conjunction with the. Um, agreement with uh, Restoration Hardware, or RH. Um, is it, were there traffic impact fees associated with that approval, or is, is our traffic impact fees something that would happen in the future as they continue to, to, you know, when they go to pull a building permit or whatnot? Um, Vice Chair McPherson, my understanding of that north, we're calling it the north lot now because soon it won't be gravel, it'll be, it'll be paved and then that name will no longer serve us. But, uh, so w w that is town-owned property that is being leased, uh, you know, to uh, Macerich or RH for use because of the number of spaces that are being lost where the R new RH building is going. Um, and so, you know, that's the arrangement for that. And, you know, I, I think that had I been involved in the public works, you know, decision making two, three years ago, I might have brought up the the uh, opportunity that really for very little extra marginal cost, we could have had this section of pathway rebuilt, you know, at the same time um, that this, uh, that the, the north lot will be, will be fixed. But they're now separate projects. And so, um, you know, there won't be any traffic impact fees. This is going to be a town responsibility. Uh, you know, what, what we d will do is continue to work with them uh, in their plan review in terms of um, the other areas of the lot and how it comes across. You know, there's mm -hmm. obviously going to be pedestrian access across okay. the lot. Um, but, yeah, they're separate projects. Okay. So, questions on this? Um, along this pathway as it is currently constructed, um, where the pathway approaches a crosswalk, because there's a couple of crosswalks, um, that uh, would that go to the, the shopping area. Um, at those points, the pathway actually gets close. It comes close to the, and becomes a sidewalk. And if, if you're riding a bicycle and, or running, jogging, it's actually counterintuitive, right? Because there's, if there's people waiting there, and I, I've ridden my bike along there, and suddenly you're in conflict with people waiting for the crosswalk. Um, so I'm hoping that the pathway stays on course, you know, a good distance from the roadway, um, as opposed to suddenly becoming right next to the, or part of a, a sidewalk. Uh, that's something we could look at as we move uh, from preliminary towards final design. But one thing I will note, and this is something for BPAC to be to be well aware of, I learned about it myself in going through this process, is that uh, you know we are in you know BCDC, the Bay Conservation Development Commission uh, territory here. Uh, we do have a lot of regulatory and permitting issues that we need to deal with, and, and so uh, we benefit from keeping the footprint where it is. Um, that kind of prevents us from having to go through too many regulatory hoops. 
you know, I'd also like to see this pathway widened. Eight feet is kind of the minimum standard. Uh, we've looked into, you know, what it would take to widen the pathway, but again, we run into a lot more costs for, for maybe not as much benefit. Um, so I'll look at those opportunities. I know that the way uh, that we're required to design the pathway is that anytime it crosses a road or a driveway, there's a stop for people that are walking or biking. <laughs> we have to put up a stop sign there uh, for, for legal and safety reasons. Uh, and so we'll look at enhancing that as we uh, redevelop the pathway. Uh, but um, yeah, the, the two stops I'm referring to don't have a have a stop. They don't. They, have a they will in the future. <laughs> well, they, the, then they'll be going into the water. Sorry, um, if you want to, I'll point to it. No, oh, I don't. I don't think the pathway goes into the water anywhere that I know of. But no, right here, if you're coming along there, that crosswalk, right? The the pathway. So yeah, we we need to use the mic. So. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Um, there's a crosswalk right here. Um, the pathway at that point um, and this point, um, so there's no cross street, so there'll be no stop for somebody coming along this way. Um, the pathway suddenly, instead of having, you know, a, uh, being farther away from the road and having, you know, four feet of dirt between the road and the pathway, suddenly the pathway becomes part of the sidewalk. And if you're riding your bicycle and if someone's waiting on that for that light, you're basically gonna plow into the person who's waiting at the light or, or going to have to stop. Yeah. That, that's easy to address, we can look at that, yeah. Okay. Do any members of the public want to address this uh, Redwood Highway update? See none, Jerry, can you move on to the Paradise Drive at Prince Royal update. All right. So this is a um, an intersection improvement, crosswalk improvement uh, at Prince Royal Passage at Paradise Drive. So brief overview of this project is the addition of ADA curb ramps, uh, Ped Refuge Island, rectangular rapid flashing beacons, improved lighting signage, and high visibility crosswalks to enhance safety on the corridor. So currently under construction, these pictures were taken yesterday. You guys may have seen the progress out there. They just poured uh, the, the curb ramps for both sides and the refuge island. Uh, there, the pavement has been marked out and, uh, will, and, and ex is expected to be placed next week uh, for the, the radius right around the the sweep of the curb and gutter. We're looking at a uh, completion by uh, sometime next month, July. So that's a that's a pretty quick overview of that one, but um, I'd be happy to to go further into any specifics if you guys have questions. So Jared, uh, Tom uh, Nofziger leads for the Cove School a walking bike train that would go from uh, the Nugget Market through that intersection and goes down to Cove. So there are many, many uh, children that use that. It is really appreciated, and I think the neighborhood's really going to benefit. It's, it's a great improvement. Mm -hmm. I agree. Okay. Yeah, it's going to be a good one. Street, the steps, lanes, and paths. So briefly on this item, uh, you know, you'll see this again at your next meeting uh, because we did get confirmation uh, from the town of Mill Valley that they're going to come over, I think, in the third Thursday in August and kind of give us a more detailed uh, overview of what they've done. Uh, you know, Jared's going to kind of talk about what the vision is in terms of uh, what we're looking at for our step lays and paths in, in Corte Madera. And, and you'll see this in the slide, but it, I figure we have to say it two or three times to kind of give you the project purpose. But, you know, from our standpoint, this is a really important community amenity uh, that, you know, we'd like to improve. And then, you know, with the voter directive in Measure F, you know, there certainly is a lot of interest in the community for disaster preparedness and emergency response. And in this particular case, this would be uh, pedestrian evacuation improvements. Mm -hmm. So what... Uh, what Mill Valley has done, what I've noticed when I'm up in their hillside neighborhoods is they have signage like evacuation this way. So sometimes, you know, a, a redwood tree falls across a road and you'd like to drive out of there and bring everything in your car, but you simply cannot. And so, uh, you know, 
uh, evacuating on foot is important. And that can be done in the current condition. I think most of our, our pathways are passable, but, but that's not our goal. Our goal is to have these in great condition as community amenities and, and evacuation routes. So with that intro, I'll turn it over to Jared on what he's found out so far. Excellent. Uh, so you can see getting bearings, the black uh, line on the bottom is Corte Madera Avenue. The red is Redwood. Uh, the yellow or orange are various other streets up there on Christmas Tree Hill. This is just Christmas Tree Hill trails, by the way. Mm -hmm. um, and then the green are all other various networks of steps, lanes, and paths. So uh, evidence here, we have quite a, a, a large volume of steps, lanes, and paths. And um, they are all various levels of disrepair. And um, we want to make sure that uh, those are, are a safe evacuation corridor for, for times when that needs to happen, as well as just uh, accessibility throughout Christmas Tree Hill for those that want to go walking and venture around. So you can see the, the extensive list on the left. Uh, maybe you can't read them all, but there's, there's over 30 uh, itemized trails and, and, and paths over there. Um, so, yeah, the volume is there, and it's, it's our effort, our intent to uh, document uh, where, we, where we have uh, deterioration, uh, where the, the need for improvement is the most, and, and try to prioritize uh, a, a process of, of rehabilitation for those. Um, that's, this is in, in its infancy, so uh, we're, we're still trying to get our bearings around how best to attack this project. Um, additional to Christmas Tree Hill, you see a, there's another uh, smaller list on the right, Chapman Tunnel, uh, Pixley, Pixley to Walnut, uh, Colonial Pathway, Edison, and Cavon's Path over by Sunnyside. So this is just uh, a quick shot, a couple uh, of these sections over at Chapman. You, you can see, if you're, not, if you're not familiar with these, I encourage you to get out and, and take a look at them. Um, some of them are in, in decent condition, so it's not all of them. Uh, that are, are in disrepair, but uh, quite, a, quite a few are, and these are just a, a few. So um, we're looking at between 2020 and 2022 as, a, as an idea of, of time frame to, to get going in full speed with this. And um, as Peter mentioned, this is in community enhancement as well as emergency evacuations. Mm -hmm. Um, and then this will be uh, further discussed at, a, at, a, at the next meeting. Uh, we are encouraging Mill Valley's representative, Andrew Poster, uh, the public works director over there, to come and, and teach us uh, about Mill Valley's program that they've implored here um, as, as evidence with, with, with this particular image. They, they have a, a pretty good setup of, of, of stairways up there, steep hillsides, and, and we're going to try to use their approach as as, as a model to, to uh, get ours in, in a better state as well. Um, so with that, I'd like to, to open it up to the committee members to, to let us know what, what really we should be focusing on and, and, and what you guys need to know or would like to know about the SLP program. So I, I know that um, <clears throat> Jenna Hale had contacted me over a year ago, and I know that there were some volunteer efforts to try and um, survey and identify as many of these streets, steps, lanes, and paths. I'm just wondering to what extent uh, town staff has been able to coordinate with whatever the uh, infancy of volunteer efforts have been. Uh, we haven't yet started uh, coordinating uh, review as far as I know maybe Peter has yeah I do I do believe we have that input um, okay. you know uh, Todd just let me know we, we have a lot of information from that so we'll use that to the extent that um, you know it's comprehensive we'll still be doing our own our own uh, review and assessment but it certainly helps to have that community input thus far okay I, uh, one thing that I noticed is that Christmas Tree Hill uh, which has the bulk of the uh, SLPs is indicated but proceeding below Corte Madera Avenue, uh, continuing downhill into Chapman Park, there are some additional uh, SLPs that uh, are, uh, should be mapped. So in terms of, um, first of all, we've talked about this for years, and so we, speaking on behalf of, I think, 
the BPAC in our prior discussions, we couldn't be more excited about this um, going from discussion to potentially uh, in, the, um, in the direction that Mill Valley has taken it. Um, so what I'd love to hear when uh, the Mill Valley Public Works person comes is to tell us a little bit more about how their grassroots volunteer efforts um, assisted so that it minimized public works time. I, I, I read a lot about Mill Valley and it seems like they, they had a volunteer steering committee that met on a regular basis and really assisted uh, the town staff. And um, the other thing that I think is going to be important, it certainly has been important in Mill Valley and I anticipate that it's going to be important here, is that in many instances the SLPs have recorded easements and in other situations there are just simply historic um, paths that, uh, or, or that uh, have been used for years but may or may not have uh, um, easements that have been recorded. And so the question I'd want to know from Mill Valley is how do they deal with uh, uh, issues of where uh, a path has historically been used, uh, it's, it's clearly necessary as part of the, the structure to provide egress in terms of, of, uh, of an emergency as well as just simply connecting neighborhoods, but uh, uh, a neighbor or, or more uh, want to keep it closed. And um, those are really the, the primary questions I'd like to hear Mill Valley discuss. <clears throat> I have a question. Uh, first of all, um, I think it's great we're looking at this. Uh, it seems like it's, this is like a gem in our community that kind of deserves a little more attention. And I think, uh, as you brought up, as it relates to public safety, I think that's a really interesting play. And I know with uh, the climate adaptation funds that are out there, it sounds like Corbin Air has received some that as uh, wildfire danger increases, uh, obviously Christmas Tree Hill is certainly in, around here is vulnerable to that. I think uh, these kind of paths are gonna become more and more relevant. Um, so just as we're looking for funding to improve paths, I think making that connection to climate adaptation and that public safety is, is something worth uh, considering. Um, Kirby. Yeah, my, my question, of I guess this group in Mill Valley when they come is um, how to record all those paths and share them with the public in the best manner because I've I've run a few of those and I'm familiar with a few of those but there's ten times as many trails as I, I thought I knew all the trails up there and I see a lot more than and and I looked on my phone and there's only, you know, a Google Earth or whatever doesn't have all those. So how did you get that map and how could we share that with the rest of the world? Well, w one thing that I'll note is that some of those paths are so overgrown you wouldn't find them unless you brought a machete with you. So, mm. um, you know, this is the network, the historic network. Uh, the usable path network, I think, is less than this. Mm. Um, and so, you know, this is part of our challenge. Part of our challenge is you know, figuring out, you know, the question that I would have that I wrote down that I didn't hear from anyone is, is how did Mill Valley fund this? How did they fund the signage? How did they fund the capital improvement? These are, these are expensive and, and somewhat difficult, uh, you know, structural improvements. You know, Jared and I looked at the ones on Chapman. I think uh, Todd and I went out there as well. And you walk up and down those and, and they're, they're, they're massive. They're, they're huge concrete stones and, and some of them are next to really big trees that have kind of uplifted those. And so a lot of times it's not just the rehabbing of uh, the pathway itself. It's, you know, what are you doing about these massive old trees that are impacting it and the ones that are overgrown? So, um, you know, we have our work cut out for us. This is going to be, uh, you know, a, a long-term project. We're not going to get it all done in a year. We're going to have to chip away at it and prioritize it and, 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 and find the funding sources for it. Uh, but it's good to hear all these questions. I didn't, I didn't know personally that, that the um, volunteers in the community were, were, had a committee and that really contributed to Mill Valley. I think that could be super helpful here. Um, but yeah, again, I'll put this, uh, this presentation will go up um, on the BPAC link in the website so anyone can pull it down and share it with whomever they like. There's one um, item just I'll share from on the Mill Valley side for those of you who are familiar with the Mill Valley uh, SLP. There's, if you're driving down the street, and there's on the street, there's a, 
a marker for how to get down. Um, so if you were driving and suddenly the tree is in front of the road, but you just, you know, there's a mark on the street, there's a path there. Because sometimes you might drive that path, you know, a hundred times and never notice that there's a path there, but there's a marker on, on the streets in Mill Valley so you can find your way down in case there's a fire or an emergency. Anyone else? Yeah, you know, um, Peter, it looks like they have an all-volunteer group that's friends of steps, lanes, and paths, and not unlike, um, you know, with highway maintenance and, and cleanup, they, they uh, you know, neighborhoods can adopt a particular path and, and uh, take that approach. So that's obviously something that we really want to hear from Mill Valley at the next meeting. Um, is there anyone in the public that would like to address potentially steps, lanes, and paths in Corte Madera? I, real, I will real quick. This is a very interesting topic to me. I live in Mill Valley, so I've been following Mill Valley for the last 10, 10 plus years. Mill Valley has over has between two and 300 steps, lanes, and paths. Um, they have a cool map you can get at the depot of all the, of all the paths. They've been mapped out. But I will tell you, it started with all volunteer effort. Um, it'd be great if you could get this a woman named Victoria Talkington to attend uh, your next meeting. She was the, the heroine on it. She's a lawyer. She did a lot of the investigation of the uh, easements, the ownership. Um, it was her passion, but it was a number of years of just digging and digging into stuff that was over 100 years old. Um, and and um, really encourage you to, to bring her over because that there's no way staff could do this. It, it's so much work, yeah. and it will mm -hmm. take uh, some volunteer effort okay. from the town. Thank you. Gene Severingos, this is very exciting to see the town uh, taking on the, I didn't know they were called SLPs, I like that. Um, I used to walk a lot of them, and you know, you go, okay, this stretch is broken, you can't use it, but there's another great stretch. And um, I recently went on a walk with Fairfax, um, with the town mayor, and Actually, I guess he's the ex-mayor, but he's on the TAM board, John Reed, and the Sustainability Committee, and they're working really hard at mending different strategic steps, lanes, and paths as um, to encourage people to walk into town instead of driving their car down the hill into town and parking, which they don't have a lot of. So they've actually been working really hard at this, and apparently they had talked about it for about 20 years, and <laughs> they finally got some teeth into it because I believe frankly, because John Reed actually took it on. And uh, they've made very good use of the um, Conservation Corps. So I highly recommend that you talk to uh, Fairfax about how they've done that. Thank you. Thank you. Cindy Winter speaking. I am just so excited and curious about this map. And I'm going to mention it to Larkspur at the next city council meeting, which will not be until July 20th. But I'm going to try to get them involved in a similar project, because I just bet up in those hills, some of our paths will meet. And that will be for the benefit of everybody. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, that's right. That's right. <laughs> had to be said. Yeah, I know. Jim Robinson, Ash Avenue. I just had a question of curiosity. I think it was a year or two ago that BPAC came up with a, I forgot what we called it, but sort of a, a game plan, a general plan for BPAC as to what our priorities were in town. And I recall there were like $6 million of bicycle improvements and $1 million of pedestrian improvements. And that $1 million was going towards Corte Madeira Avenue. So my question is, is this in addition to or in lieu of, or is there any correlation between the two? Well, I'm not completely familiar with the numbers that uh, Mr. Armstrong is talking about. I do know that the Corte Madera Avenue uh, walkway was recently updated in terms of cost estimate. Uh, the prior one was 1.5, and now it's it's closer to $3 million to do that one pathway along Corte Madera Avenue mm -hmm. um, due to the constraints and the, and the change in grade and elevation there. Um, so, yeah, this is a separate effort. Uh, you know, this is something that, you know, I think that along with a lot of other priorities that the town has with with the passage of measure f we have at least some leeway and some seed money to get this thing going uh, and so that's exciting but we will continue to look at grant opportunities and uh, you know phasing and staging of this program uh, it will be it will be a multi multi-million dollar investment in the community 
but at the same time, because it has you know uh, so many safety and and uh, uh, community amenity and, and emergency response benefits to it, I think that the council will uh, work with staff to to find out you know uh, where that money might come from. Um, so no, it's not part of any of that six slash one million dollar priority from years prior. Okay. Any additional discussion before we close on this item? Yeah, I would add one more thing to the list because um, I do recall in the Mill Valley uh, SLP story, um, I recall there being a lawsuit. Um, and one thing I would want to know if they're coming here is why that happened and how we can avoid it. Question. <laughs> <clears throat> All right, well that concludes our project updates and I appreciate the efficiency of, of staff in, in getting us through all of that as quickly as we did. Yeah. It's fantastic. Um, Pessimist, aren't we? <laughs> if uh, we can have a, a motion to approve the uh, minutes from uh, February 15th. Uh, I, I need to make one small amendment. Please. In the interest of good intergovernmental relations. Um, the, it is the, uh, on number five, uh, under policy council of the Metropolitan, it's the Metropolitan Transportation Commission, so-called, known as MTC, for the record. Okay. That's all. Any other proposed revisions? Motion to approve the uh, minutes from February 15th. Motion to approve the minutes. Second. Okay. All in favor? Aye. 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 All right. So um, is there any reason that uh, August 16th will not meet work for anyone or several people? Or is that going to work? Works for me? That's good for me, too. Works for me. All right. August 16th will be our next BPAC meeting. And Fine. Peter, if... If it's appropriate, if there's been any movement on it, I'd love to see the Paradise Drive multi-use path from, uh, from westward to up, up, and away uh, come back for a project update to see if there's been any additional discussion and movement in that direction. Understood. All right. And can, can I add another item uh, that would be nice to hear about is we might have touched on it earlier, but just the uh, the plan for the Cordemeter Creek crossing uh, to um, as part of the North South Greenway. The uh, it sounds like Caltrans is engaged in that, but just kind of understanding where that's at, particularly the funding for that, because I know there was originally funding set aside for for the Cordemeter Creek crossing, and then that funding was diverted over to the, to address some gaps in San Rafael of the bike trail on the smart train line? That actually wasn't the crossing. Uh, oh, okay. That was a different section of the pathway, but we will give you an update at the next meeting, and right. then everyone will be will know what we know. Excellent. Thanks. And then, then uh, Peter, my final comment is that we have been fortunate in the past in that uh, our BPAC agenda also uh, had uh, posted online the supporting documentation uh, you know when when it was available in advance and to the extent that we can continue to do that for the public I know that it makes a big difference in terms of uh, people being able to look and determine is is it worth my showing up shall I just watch it online do I really have particular comments they can come with much more focused comments if that could be that packet can be posted ahead of time okay and with that Thank you very much. That concludes our meeting. Let's say goodbye to Bob. Oh, yeah. Bob, if you're still watching, get well soon. Get well soon. We'll keep the chair open for you, buddy. Thank you.